Welcome to this chapter called Closing the Real Estate Transaction. You will hear this called by many names. The settlement. Sometimes I've heard passing papers. Uh, but I like to call it payday. All right. So everything we have been discussing up until now will culminate in today's activity of the closing of the real estate. We're going to talk about the two sides, you know, the buyer side and the seller side and what they are going to do and what they're going to expect to happen. We're going to talk a little bit about the laws that deal with the settlement procedure, the actual procedure on how we do all of this closing. So sit back, let's get ready and let's get started. All right, so when dealing with the closing, there's going to be two sides to this. We're going to talk about both sides. Now, remember, if you represent one side or the other, that is called single agency. And you could potentially work both sides, which is called dual agency. Um, so you may end up doing both sides of this. There are some pre-closing procedures that have to be done. And this is what you have been doing for that last 30 days, 45 days. You know, you've been having the inspection. You got the appraisal. You did all of this stuff. And all of that is going to lead up to the day of closing. So let's talk a little bit about what the buyer side is going to want. So the buyer's main concern is that he gets what is called a clear title. He wants the seller to be able to deliver a good title or a clear title. Remember when the buyer wrote the purchase agreement, in that purchase agreement, he asked for a general warranty deed. And one of the statements in that general warranty deed said, that the seller will remove all of the encumbrances. That is what the buyer is looking for, is this thing called good title. Now, there's some other things the buyer's going to be looking for in his stack of paperwork, and it's all going to be in this paperwork that the title company will present to the buyer. So don't really have to worry about telling them uh, they're going to know, all right? There may be things like the survey that's in the buyer's packet. There may be the title insurance policy that's in the packet. There's going to be the appraisal that the lender had done. There could be a lease if the buyer's buying a rental property. So all of these things are going to be in there. There could be a receipt of something that got paid, but yet hasn't been recorded yet. We have seen this many times where something popped up on the title work and the seller went, oh man, I forgot about that. And he went and paid it off. But remember, I spoke about the fact that there is a physical delay in recording. There is a process where they have to go down and record and it has to get stamped and all of that. That is a physical process and in some counties could take four, five, six weeks to actually get recorded. Well, you don't want to wait on that. So it's possible that the seller may bring a receipt showing that it's paid to the closing because it may still be on the records as being a lien. We had this with one of my sellers years ago. It was a good friend of mine, and thank goodness, because um, I could be a little more, you know, blatant with him. And there was an American Express lien that Brent had forgot to pay, and they had put a lien on his property. And he was, you know, fat, dumb, and happy and didn't even realize it. We sold his house. It popped up on the uh, records. So while we were doing this whole closing process, he was working with American Express to get it released and paid. 
Well, he got it paid like six or seven days before closing. So American Express actually sent a notarized letter to Brent saying that this lien has been paid and will be recorded. And then it was signed by their legal counsel and it was notarized. So when we went to closing, the buyer saw this lien, but yet Brent said, well, here's the receipt showing that it's paid. It just has not been recording, recorded. So while it looks like there's a lien on the property, there really isn't, all right? You might see some of those. All right. Now, another thing the buyer is going to want to do is what we call the final walkthrough or the final property inspection. And this is a very highly suggested activity. It's not required. There's no state law that says it has to happen. But you as the buyer's agent better explain the ramifications to going or not going. And I have seen people go to close or go to a final walkthrough and there be no problems. That's what I hope you get. There could be going to a final walkthrough and there could be issues that have to be resolved. There could be not going to a final walkthrough and there be no problems. And the worst case obviously is the buyer to not go to a final walkthrough and then there be problems after it closes, all right? Because that is going to result in a lawsuit. Once the buyer takes the property, he is taking it in that as is condition. So you want to make sure that you go look at it before closing. Now I try and train my new agents that they want to look at the property as close to the time of closing as possible. That way, nothing happens. If you went, for example, if you went two or three days before, there's two or three days of something that could happen. So I usually try and tell my agents, hey, schedule a closing like at uh, one or two o'clock in the afternoon and um, go to the walkthrough like at 9 a.m. Because what you're trying to verify is all of the repairs that you asked for have been completed. You also want to make sure that the property is in the same condition that it was when you made the offer. Remember, you made this offer about 30 days ago, 45 days ago. So you want to make sure that all four walls are there and the roof's still on it. That. You want to make sure anything that you ask to stay, like the washer and dryer, is actually there. And the other side of that is you want to make sure things that you specifically ask to be gone are actually gone. Okay? Had a deal several years ago. House was beautiful. However, there was a stack of wood along the back side of the house. And we asked the other agent, hey, hey, what's the wood for? This house doesn't have a fireplace. And the seller said, oh, the, or the seller's agent said, oh, the sellers are campers. And they take wood with them when they go. So that's their wood. We're like, great. Our home inspector says this is a great place for wood destroying insects to be formed. We don't want that wood because there's no fireplace. Make sure it's gone. So the day of our final walkthrough, we get there and the house is vacant and everything's great, except this rick of wood is still leaning up against the backside of the house. So I call the other agent and I'm like, hey, dude, this wood is still here. Are you guys going to get it? Now, you get to play chicken. You guys know what chicken is? Chicken's an old game where it used to be people would like drive towards each other and see who swerves first and see who flinches because the other agents said, oh, come on, Raymond, it's just a stack of wood. Would your buyers not close on their dream home over a stack of wood that we forgot? And now you get to say, oh, come on, listing agent. Would your sellers lose a sale 
over a stack of wood. Because here's the deal. In this particular case, I had the upper hand. Because the house was vacant, which means the sellers had already moved out. And I told the other agent, dude, my buyers may not buy. Now, would they have? I doubt it. But you get to use that hammer because I told them, I said, look, if my buyers not decide not to buy over this, guess what your sellers are going to have to do? <laughs> Move back in. All that stuff they moved out, put in the truck, and they now got to put it back in because there's no sale. Would your sellers really risk all of that for not doing something that we literally asked for? I mean, it wasn't like at the last minute we said, oh, yeah, and by the way, no, we actually put that in the purchase agreement that the wood on the south side of the back of the house should be removed prior to closing. So he said, okay, hold on. So he, we were standing in the house, and about that time, we see a pickup come around to the back, and it's a father and a son who were got out threw all the wood in the back of the pickup and they were calling us every name in the book, you know, rah, 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 and they threw it in the back of the pickup and drove off. So they did come and get it. So when we went to closing, everybody was happy, but that is a case of you wanting to make sure I had a situation several years ago where a guy, we were scheduled to go to the walkthrough and he said, Hey, I can't make the final walkthrough. I'm the, first shift manager for this production company and I can get off for the closing, but I can't get off four hours early. Um, he goes, it'll be okay. I'm like, okay, David, but you understand. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. So we go to closing, closing happens, boop, title transfers. I get home later that night, about six o'clock, I get a call from him and I'm like, and he said, Hey, Raymond, just wanted to let you know that when I got back to the property, the sellers took every light bulb in the house. I'm like, what? He's like, yes, they took the light bulbs out of the light fixtures. They took the light bulbs out of the bathroom, out of the bedroom, out of the chandeliers, all of them. They took every light bulb. What can I do? And I told him, I said, well, go buy light bulbs. And he's like, well, can I sue them? I'm like, most certainly, but it is now a lawsuit because when you accepted the property, you accepted it in that condition. You chose to not go look at it. And because of that, you now have a house with no light bulbs. And he's like, well, I'm going to file a lawsuit. I'm like, okay, it would be a small claims case. But in the meantime, you're going to have to go buy light bulbs because lawsuit small claims is going to be three or four weeks. You're going to live in the dark. <clears throat> so he actually <laughs> had to go buy light bulbs. Now there's more to that story that can be a whole bunch of fun because a couple days later he called me and said, Hey, I filed a small claims. It cost me like $280 to buy all these light bulbs. So I filed a small claim suit. I'm like, Oh wow. That's, that's cool. I guess. And he said, I want you to come up and testify. And I said, absolutely not. Because remember what else happens at boop, the closing, the title transfer. Not only does title transfer, but agency terminated. Remember one of the things that terminates agency is the completion of the deal. So when he closed on that property boop, and it transferred, he became the owner in severalty of that property and my agency terminated, which means I no longer have care, obedience, loyalty, disclosure. I still maintain that accounting and confidentiality, but this directive to me to protect him by coming to this small claims court would have fallen under loyalty or care. It was gone. 
And I told him, I'm like, no, I'm not coming up there. I told you to go to closing. You didn't go to closing. I am not driving way to the north side of Indianapolis to go to a small claims court. You can go to that small claims court and you can, you know, talk to the judge and let him decide. But I no longer care. Now, I'm guessing I probably did not get any referrals from that client after that because he kind of got mad at with me at me but i told him he didn't follow and then he paid the price okay